Let's continue to dig deep into the Word of God. Um, we're in the first week of December, and I don't know about you, but it felt so fast. You know, uh, I could still remember when we started this year, but now here we are. We're at the end of 2021, and I think it is fitting to always remember as we are ending the year, we're going to begin with the Lord in mind. We're going to end the year with the Lord in mind. Amen? So it's with the purpose that December is uh, the month that is dedicated to as a remembrance of the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. So... Um, I think it is fitting to continue um, the topic that we're talking about gratitude and generosity because um, if we are to ever be inspired or take the model or base everything that we believe about generosity and giving, and it is from none other than our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ himself, all right? So let's begin with uh, reading again the, um, the main text that we begin this series with, Proverbs 11, verse 24. To 26. Um, if uh, you are, if you don't have the verse, you can just read it from the screen. Proverbs 11:24 to 26. I'm reading from the message paraphrase, and this is what it says: The word, the world of the generous gets larger and larger; the world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. The one who blesses others is abundantly blessed. Those who help others are helped. Curses on those who drive a hard bargain. Blessings on all who play fair and square. The world of the generous gets larger and larger. The world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. Amen. Now let's rehearse uh, some of the points that we have learned so far. What we have learned is that, you know, the ultimate expression of gratitude is generosity. The ultimate expression of gratitude is generosity. I mean, you can confess to be a grateful person, but in the end it will show um, whether or not you are true to what you confess to be on the degree that you are generous, on the degree that you're living your gratitude in a form of generosity. In the past, we also learned that our God is a generous God. You know, so our God is a generous God in that which generosity begins with God. Generosity begins with God. So um, we can't even start to talk about generosity without, you know, referring to him, without beginning with him, without uh, basing our, our confession or our knowledge in him. So generosity begins with God. Uh, our, our God is, is, you know, his very being is synonymous to this understanding, this concept, this principle of generosity. And then we learn that uh, if we have a generosity problem, you know, at the roots of it is none other than the gospel problem. And what we meant by that is that many times those who have struggled living a generous life is because they don't truly understand the gospel as it is intended to be understood. You know, uh, they don't understand the heart of God, which is that's basically the content of the gospel, which is the heart of God. And many of us, you know, we may know the church, we may know ministry, we may know a thing or two about uh, Christianity, but... You know, if you confess to know about God, His heart, and the gospel, then it's impossible for you to not live a life of generosity. So underneath, at the roots, at the bottom of it, of a generosity problem, is uh, one who does not truly understand you know, the, the, the gospel. We also learned that last week, you know, um, we, we understand that when we talk about generosity, uh, two of the major uh, classification or category is material generosity and also relational generosity. So last week, we learned about relational generosity, and we learned that we are most like God when we are generous, uh, and particularly in relational aspect, when we are generous in forgiving. If you remember last week, you know how when Jesus was asked uh, by the disciples, who's the greatest in the kingdom, you know, he Begin by answering those in an inversion mode. You know, it's not those who rule, but those who, who serve. It's not those who, who are rich, but those who, who give. And also, at the end of it, he says, you know, the greatest are those who are, who are great at forgiving, who are big on forgiving. Uh, and we learned that basically forgiveness is canceling debts. 
not making other people pay for what they are liable to, whatever that means, all right? So this morning, I want to talk about the grace of giving. As we are uh, beginning the month of December, I want to share with you about the grace of giving, all right? The grace of giving. Now, the word grace, it means a virtue, a virtue coming from God. Or, you know, in other words, it's a morally good character or behavior that is originated from God. A virtue that comes from God. So when we, when, when we talk about the grace of giving, you know, we're talking about this uh, uh, godly characteristic, you know, of, 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 of giving. You know, and, and uh, I think the two goes hand in hand, goes together. And uh, when we talk about the word generous, you know, the basic understanding is that a readiness to give more than is necessary. And I couldn't think of any other person in our life, in this world, in this universe, that can fit that description other than our God. And we're going to learn more in the passage that we're going to read from John chapter 10, verse 10 to 11, in which our God is not only ready, He has given, but He also gave more than is required or necessary. So let's begin to read in John chapter 10, verse 10 to 11. I'm reading from the uh, Passion Translation. And this is what it says, A thief has only one thing in mind. He wants to steal, slaughter, and destroy. But I have come to give you everything in abundance. I have come to give you everything in abundance, more than you expect, life in its fullness until you overflow. Verse 11, I am the good shepherd who lays down my life as a sacrifice for the sheep. I have come to give you everything in abundance, more than you expect, life in its fullness until you overflow. I am the good shepherd who lays down my life as a sacrifice for the sheep. Now, if, if, if we read it in another translation, in living translation, this is what it says. The thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. My purpose is to give life in all its fullness. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So there is, again, if you saw from this two translation, I have the emphasis on God saying to give you, to give you as a sacrifice in the living transition, to give life, lays down his life, lays down my life. So this is what I meant when it says that when we want to, rec when we want to understand or live in generosity, it has to begin with the recognition that generosity begins with God, that God is a generous God. And this is exactly one of the verse that teach us about who he is, his mindset, his mode of behavior, his intention, his desire, his goal, and what he has done. You know, he, he, he made that contrast, a comparison that a thief comes to still kill and destroy, to still slaughter and destroy. But I have come to give you. So if we want to talk about generosity, we want to talk about uh, giving, we're not original in that aspect. God is the originator in generosity. Our God is a generous God. And our God is a giving God. You know, can we go to the next slide? So we're not original in that aspect. We learn it or we get it from someone just the same way that our attitude, our behavior, our characteristic is not original to us. It's something that has been passed on and mostly by our parents or those who nurtured us. In the same way, spiritually, we're not original when it comes to generosity. You know, we are generous because we worship a generous God, and we worship a giving God. So if, if you have a problem toward giving, then you don't truly understand His heart or the gospel. This is what is important to be uh, emphasized again and again and again. You know, and from this passage, we learn that our God is a generous God who gives abundantly to his church. If you look on verse 10, he says, the thief comes to still kill and destroy, but I've come to give you everything in abundance. In the living God, it says, in all its fullness, he did not only come to give, but he gave in abundance. 
So our God is a generous God who gives abundantly to His church. And then we learn also that our God is a generous God who gives continually. So it's not just abundantly. It's not a one-time deal. It's not just a seasonal deal. We can be generous in one time, in one season, but as for our God, He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the same every season of our life. He's the same year in, year out, week in, week out, day in, day out. He's giving continuously. He's abundant continually to His church. And He's also a generous God who gives sacrificially to His church. Sacrificially to His church. Because I learned that you can be generous but not necessarily sacrificial. Hello? Uh, But our God... You know, maybe the shortest understanding is that when he gives, he can feel his gift. Many of us, we choose to give, you know, casually. So you can't feel it transferring from you to the object of your giving. But when you give sacrificially, you can feel it because it requires. It requires sacrifice. You know, uh, um, there are those who can give uh, effortlessly. But God is calling for his true worshiper, he says, to worship in spirit and in truth. In other words, to live it. You know, not just to, you know, understand it, but to live it. And to live it, it means to be ready to, you know, be sacrificial about it. You know, because to live for God, it means to lose your own. Just the same way he has lost his own so that you may live. So, you know, our God is not only a generous God who gives abundantly, but he also gives continually and he gives sacrificially. Why do I feel it's important to uh, repeat this again and again to us? Because this needs to be our bedrock of conviction about our God. And this needs to be who we are. This needs to be how we live our life. All right? So, Especially this season, you know, we begin December in the season of Advent, you know, waiting for Christ in the traditional Western church, you know, waiting for uh, the birth of Christ. I think it's fitting for us to remember, you know, when we talk about giving, we're not uh, original in that thoughts. We get it from Him. We're not the originator of it. God is the originator of generosity, and this is how he is generous, all right? So let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1 to 9. I, wanna, I want to uh, add upon the concept of generosity and giving, uh, as is found in the early church, in the ministry of Apostle Paul. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1 to 9, um, reading from... The New International Version, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1 to 9. And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian church. The grace God has given the Macedonian church. The Macedonian churches, sorry. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overwhel- overflowing joy and their extreme poverty well up in rich generosity. That's a strange combination. Overflowing joy and extreme poverty well up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord, and then by the will of God also to us. All right? Let me just stop right there, and then I'll continue the following verses later. So, um, this is something that is really powerful. It's a story about uh, Paul throughout his missionary journey. And um, I want to share with you something that is practical Um, from the story of the original church. And if you think that we live a different life than them, maybe there are certain truth to that, but for the most part, 
they experience the same struggle with us. You know, it seems if you think that as if, you know, every day we are riled with problem, challenges, plague, natural disaster, just to let you know, it hasn't changed even since in the day of the apostle. So I think it is, we can learn a thing or two from how the early church lived their life following the, the cue from the Lord, living the word of God, so that we can do the same thing in our time, in our generation. How can we be real and be living life as a generous people of the Lord? So a little background on this uh, um, passage is that Paul actually at the writing of this, he was um, on his third missionary journey collecting financial offering for the mother church, quote unquote, which is the church in Jerusalem and Judea. So I want to give you a disclaimer. We've talked about generosity in general. We've talked about relational generosity. Today, we're going to talk about material generosity. We want to talk about generosity as a form of grace of giving and, and not just giving any kind of giving, but we want to talk about financial giving. So you pick, maybe some of you say, oh, man, I picked the wrong day to come to church. But no, today you pick the wrong day to be in the church and listening to this because we can't shy away from this topic. You know, we can't back down from this topic because this is something that is very relevant. This is something that is important in the Lord. Uh, I mean, this is something that, a topic that has been uh, central in the Bible, especially in the ministry of Jesus, especially in the gospel. So again, as I said, if you have problem in generosity, you don't understand the gospel. There are 7,000 promises in the Bible. You know, and every promise has a premise, has a precondition. You know, but what's interesting is that even in the ministry of Jesus, no one talks about giving more than Jesus. And the bulk of it is giving financially, giving materially. You know, the word believe is used 272 times in the Bible. The word pray is used 371 times in the Bible. The word love is used 714 times in the Bible. And the word give is used 2,152 times in the Bible. No one speak about giving more than Jesus. No one speak about money more than Jesus. And you trace this back to the apostle. The apostle talks about that. You, you begin to wonder why. You know, maybe because they're consistent to their admission that the root of evil is the love of money. It's the love of material possession. And that's why it's important for us to put the right perspective in that. And we learn that giving, you know, is an attitude, is one practical thing that we can do to tame this root of evil. Because when you give, you're actually shifting the loving of things to the love of God. When you give, you shift from the love of things to the love of God. Especially if you know that he continuously talks about giving. You know, and not only he talks about giving in general, but he also talks about giving to his church. And church, not just a universal church, the church in the world, but he speaks about the local church. The church where you are planted. Basically, if you read the Bible, you know, all those episodes, Romans, uh, Philippians, uh, uh, Corinthians, uh, Colossians, uh, Galatians, Rome, what are those? Those are local churches. So yes, give to uh, the charity, give to the poor, give to, to all those who are in need in the world. But don't neglect also to give to the local church where you are shepherded. You know, and um, maybe uh, you are sitting there squirming, feeling awkwardly, but this subject is not an awkward subject in the Bible. And we as a church have decided long ago that we will never be awkward about giving, about giving of money, because we are not about it. Maybe you are here for the first time this week ever. Oh, man, another church talk about money. But to those who have been here for 20-something years, you know how many times I talk about money. And not because I don't believe in it, but I believe that, you know, the giving of money, the giving finances should be the overflowing of your faith through Christ. You know, for the longest time, we never pass on the offering bucket because we believe that you are to bring your offering to the Lord. We put it here. And now even, thank God for the pandemic, we no longer have the boxes right here. Not because we no longer believe in giving, 
But I think it, it, it exemplifies the beliefs that it ought to be a, a, something that you bring joyfully without compulsory, without any terror, intimidation. It ought to be the extension of your worship. The same way you sing in the church and you worship. The same way you speak the word of God as a form of conviction and worship. The same way you give to the Lord as a form of your worship. You know, so we are not one to intimidate or to say, oh, if you don't give something bad will happen to you. No, 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 no. I would rather spend energy to focus on the benefit of why you give. So we're going to talk about this today. And this is actually a secret principle that if you get it, it will set your life on the right track and it will bless you abundantly. You know, so Paul was on his third missionary journey, and he's trying to collect financial gift because the mother church, currently the church in Jerusalem, Judea, was in hardship. So he was actually collecting it, collecting something that has been promised or raised long ago, since a year ago, approximately. So the offering was for that church. And what's interesting is that the Gentile churches, the Gentile churches means the non uh you remember in, 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 the, in, in the Bible, it says that when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you shall receive power. You shall be my witness in Jerusalem, Judea, you know, the central first, and then to Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. The Gentile church mean the uh, not purely uh, Jewish population. So these Gentile churches, they felt that they are indebted to the mother church because they have ministered salvation to them. So this is a good principle to learn. This is a good principle to learn. Listen to what Paul says in Romans chapter 15, first, uh, Romans 15, verse 27, 25 to 27. She sa- he says, For you see the believers in Macedonia and Achaia have eagerly taken up an offering for the poor among the believers in Jerusalem. Verse 27. They were glad to do this because they feel they owe a real debt to them. Since the Gentiles received the spiritual blessings of the good news from the believers in Jerusalem, they feel the least they can do in return is to help them financially. Hello? This is a good principle. Number one, you never forget those who help you in life. Are you listening, church? You never forget those who help you in life. You are grateful to them. Because God chose people to be in your life to help you. You know, the truth is, I am fully aware of this, especially for my life, is that I'm standing on somebody else's shoulder. I'm not where I am to be had it not been because of people who pay the price so that I can be where I am today. And I will never erase them from my life, even though if at the present time I'm not seeing eye to eye with them. Because that's the reality of life. But I will never erase them from my book of gratitude. I will never forget them. Because apparently that's the spirit of the gospel. That's the spirit of gratitude. And the same way we respect and we honor, we are gracious to our parents. We never forget the one who paid the price, who sacrificed for us so that we are where we are today. You feel indebted to them. You know, the world would teach you live life on your own, pull yourself on your own bootstrap so that you don't owe no one a favor. Is that biblical? Because sometimes we don't want to owe anybody anything so that we can be ourselves, nobody can say anything to us. But the truth in the gospel is that we go forward because we're standing on somebody else's shoulder. If you are where you are today because somebody has paved the way for you. And for you not to admit that is pride on your part. It's pride on your part. So if you've been blessed by someone, acknowledge them. Be grateful for them. The least you can do is pray for them. And in this passage, the church, the Gentile church, and we will learn later on why this is great. Because not only they are the one that has been outcasted by the majority of Jewish believers because they're not considered pure Jew. 
But when the mother church are experiencing hardship, listen to their response. That's true gospel. That's true faith. They could have said, oh, you know what? Where were they when we suffer? You know. But no, they did not think along that line of thought. Instead, they said, no, we would not have been blessed with the grace of salvation had it not been because of their generosity. So now that they are in need, it is our obligation as the body of Christ, as a family, to help them financially. Are you here this morning? It's a good principle to have in your life. You never forget. You never abandon those who help you in life. That's the core, the essence of gratitude. You don't take it for granted. And if you've been blessed by the ministry of this church, then it's not too much for you to also bless this church financially. Oops. <laughs> this is where I lost you. I hope not. But this is a biblical principle. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1 to 9. And then the Corinthians church, despite their prospering state, apparently, so this is the problem. Apparently, this is why Paul wrote this message. Because apparently, despite all the other churches, and especially the Gentiles church taking part in this collection, the Corinthian church have not been taking their part, despite them being one of the most prosperous church, one of the most prosperous city. But the Macedonian, in turn, was actually the church in their extreme poverty. If you go back and read again in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, you know, this is what's said about the church in, 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 in Macedonia. In the midst of a very severe trial. So actually, this is a, an area-wide problem. It's not just in Jerusalem and Judea. The church in Macedonia too are actually experiencing severe trial. You know, maybe, maybe just like what we're going through right now, pandemic or something, you know, uh, uh, inflation or economic meltdown or something. I don't know, a very severe trial. But listen to this. In the midst of their very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. It's got to be the gospel in their life, in their heart. Extreme trial, but yet they have overflowing joy combined with extreme poverty equals to a welling up in rich generosity. That's not a normal response. When you are in extreme poverty, you're not just in poverty, but it says extreme poverty. But instead, they well up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, even beyond their ability. Entirely on their own. And actually, if you, if you read in other verses, they were actually pleading to Paul, hey, don't turn us down. Give us the opportunity to also bless the church in Jerusalem. Wow. You remember in the book of Malachi, it says, do not rob God. And then in that passage says, how do you rob God? When you hold back your tithe and offering and everything. I get a new understanding. Actually, when you stop being generous, you're not robbing God of what he has because, you know, he doesn't need your money, actually. But here's the truth. You are robbing God from the opportunity for him to bless you. Because the Bible says that when you give, then you will be given. When you give, you will be given. When you are blessed, you will be blessed. So when, by, by withholding things just for yourself, you are actually robbing God from the very opportunity to bless your life. It's not me. It's the Bible. It's what the Word of God says. So Paul was actually, you know, reminding the Corinthians, hey, listen, you know, you've promised and you have the means, but you have not been true to your promise. But you can learn from this church that are in extreme poverty and having severe trial, but yet they do not lack a joy in the Lord. And as a result, they are welling up in rich generosity. And this is what's, what's very interesting. Verse 5, Paul says, They gave themselves first of all to the Lord 
and then by the will of God also to us. So this is what's important. Before you can give your substance to the purpose of God, you must first give yourself to the person of God. Before you can give your substance to the promise or the purpose of God, you must first give yourself to the person of God. And the, the Macedonians are able to do this because they have given their heart to Christ first. That's why at the roots of generosity problem is a gospel problem. You don't know him. You are not in him. He is not in you. It's impossible for you to be saying, I am a believer, I am a Christian, but you're not being generous in your life. Because the two words contradicts one another, the two concepts. Before you can give your substance, your resources, your money, your everything to the purpose of God, to the promise of God, you must first give yourself to the person of God. And we see the fruit of this in the Macedonian church, you know. They were sold out for Christ. They gave their heart to Christ. And it is because of the ministry from the mother church. And now they feel indebted and they say, you know, hey, don't give us, don't forfeit us from the opportunity to pay them back, to bless them back. Don't rob us from God's opportunity to bless us back. Because that's as simple as is that. When you give to God, when you give to his work, when you give to his church, you're blessing God. And it's impossible for him not to fulfill what he has promised to you. Because what he says is that when you bless him, he will bless you back. So church, this is something that is very central in the message of the gospel. And this is what Paul says to the Corinthians, his urge in 2 Corinthians 8 verse 7. But since you excel in everything. So Paul did not deny that the church in Corinth is a very thriving. It's a sophisticated church, modern, progressive church. You know, doing well. Doing well. So this is what he says. Since you excel in everything. In faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you. See that you also excel in the grace of giving. See that you also excel in the grace of giving. Listen, church. You can have an appearance of a church. You can have an appearance of a Christian. You can be excellent in your speech. Maybe you are, you know, your speech is gracious. You know, have the, you know, hint of once or twice, you know, the word of God. Maybe you have the appearance of, of uh, you have earnestness. You know, you have knowledge. But Paul was making the same plea to the kind of church who is considered perfect. But he has this to add. See that you also excel. Excel means not only existence, but it's striving. It goes through the roof. Beyond the threshold. Beyond just minimum requirement. That you excel in the grace of giving. In this grace of giving. Remember the word grace? It's a virtue from God. And we are worshiping the God who says he comes to give us life and life abundantly. How dare you confess to have the God that comes to give abundantly to you and not being generous to other people. You bring shame to the very God that you worship. Because it is not your reputation that's at stake, but it's the reputation of generous God that is at stake in how you choose to live. That's why Paul pleaded to the Corinthians, see that you also excel in this grace of giving, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. For you know the virtue, the morally good character and behavior that is Christ which is he is so generous beyond belief. And the word of God says that, so that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. So 
if you are recipient of the grace of God through his salvation, through his son, Jesus Christ, guess what? You're rich. You're blessed abundantly. You are one that has been transferred from poverty to the richness of his blessing. And Paul was pleading the same way to you, that though, you know, that we excel in this grace of giving. Because this grace of giving is the very nature of Christ, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. We believe in blessing people relationally, but we are also in blessing materially. We believe in giving financially. And you never forget those who have ministers to you. You never forget those who have blessed you and helped you to be where you are right now. And it's a biblical understanding. It's a biblical principle. Today, I surrender and I submit this teaching to you the same way Paul make a pleading to the church in Corinth. That despite your excellence, see to it that you also excel in this grace of giving. Because the way you give, and I'm not talking relationally today. I'm not going to beat around the bush. I'm going to say it and spell it to you like it is. The way you give financially, it tells where your heart is. It tells who your Lord is. It tells whether or not the gospel has penetrated into the deepest part of your heart. If you're still counting beans, it means that you look at your money as the source, not Christ as the source. For if we know that Jesus Christ is our source, then we know that he has come to give us abundantly, continually, and sacrificially. So I want to encourage you this morning. If this is your church, if you've been blessed into this church, and you know this is home for you, I'm not talking about those of you who are here for the first time or visiting, but if this is your home, I mean, listen to what Paul says. I pray that you excel in this grace of giving so that through this house, so many works can be done because we shall never lack anything. Amen? This is not for me, this is not for any single person in the church, but this is for the continuation of the work of God through this church. This church started out for, with a humble beginning 28 years ago that started out in simple students. Students who are inexperienced, you know, our pockets are empty, but our hearts are full with the promises of God, with the will of God. And look what the Lord has done. 28 years later, and I know that God is going to do even greater in the days ahead. This church, since the beginning, the DNA, this church has been built on the backbone of students who gave everything to the Lord because the Lord has given everything to them. I pray that, you know, that generational DNA will never perish from this church. I pray that every single one of you will also excel in the grace of giving. Excel in the grace of giving for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, as we learn this word, teach us to not put a filter on our mind, on our heart, on our ears and have a selective listening mode to only listen what we want to listen but dismiss the true word of God I pray this morning oh God that you would minister deep into our heart and I pray that the truth of your word I pray that the truth of your word oh God speak and minister deeply into the heart of your people Teach us, O oh God, to be like the Macedonian church that despite our severe trial, despite our extreme poverty, we never lose our joy. And as a result, with overflowing joy, even in the midst of our extreme poverty, we will well up in rich generosity. Help us, O oh God. Help us, O oh Lord, to see beyond our own condition. Help us to fix our eyes on you. Help us to plant our all conviction in the word of the Lord. Help us to stand in the conviction of your holy word. 
And help us, O Holy Spirit, that we may excel in this grace of giving. For we have known the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have said, I have come to give you everything in abundance. More than you expect. Life in its fullness until you overflow. I am the good shepherd who lays down my life as a sacrifice for the sheep. We know that generosity begins with you because you are a generous God. Today I pray, Holy Spirit, that you begin to make right what was wrong, the conviction that was wrong in our heart about you, about your characters. And help us to begin to walk where you walk, to live where you live, and to become more like Christ. I pray this morning, Holy Spirit, that your church will rise up with a biblical conviction. Help us to never forget those who labor among us, those who have helped us, those who have contributed to us. Help us to never be an ungrateful generation, an ignorant generation who knows not to be grateful, who, who never felt indebted to anyone, who never realized that we are where we are because you have sent people along our way to help us. Remind us this morning, Lord, that we stand on somebody else's shoulder. Those who have paved the way and paid the price, help us to do the same. Maybe not to the same person, but to other people. Help us to live a life of gratitude and generosity. Help us to excel in the grace of giving. For we know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah.